Hello, my name is Michelle, and you're listening to Profit is a Choice. Darren Virasamy is the co-founder and chief operating officer of 34 Strong, a new breed of consultancy that believes everyone deserves a great place to work and that any workplace can be great. A leading expert in the global employee engagement community, the 34 Strong team leverages the Gallup StrengthsFinder assessment and Q12 to create massive shifts within organizations, both culturally and on the bottom line. Darren is a nationally acclaimed keynote speaker and facilitator on the topic of strengths, leadership, and employee engagement. Darren's 34 Strong business partner, Brandon Miller, is the co-author with his wife, Anna Lynn, of a strengths-based parenting book titled Play to Their Strengths, which is due out in July of 2019. Darren and I met at a Profit First convention last fall, and when I heard Darren speak on StrengthsFinder, which I've used in my business since I think around 2014 or 2015, I knew it was going to be a great session. After sharing, Darren and I were just chatting during the break, you know how you're all mingling around getting um, something to drink and a snack, and we were just chatting. And he mentioned to me when we were sharing that I should go check out my bottom five strengths. I, you know, there are 34. I had been really focused on my top five. And he said, you should go look at your bottom five because those are usually your blind spots. And so I, I couldn't wait hardly, but I came home and immediately the next business day I did that. And it was amazing. What was so interesting was I already knew that those were areas that I I would that I felt weaker in. I had already even mentioned them on other podcasts when people asked me my weaknesses. I'd already kind of talked all around them. I just didn't have them quantified with the word. And so really seeing them on paper gave them weight. And it made me stop and ask, what am I going to do about that? What am I really going to do? I'd already put some things in place, but not not as intentionally as I wanted to be. And so from that point forward, I've really made a plan and have been focusing on that for even this year to work with and around my bottom five strengths while always keeping focus um, primarily on my top five ten, which is where I work with ease. And so StrengthsFinder has totally impacted my business, my marketing, my service, my delivery, and I've seen it do the same thing for other individuals and businesses. If you have not yet completed this assessment, I encourage you to take the time to do that. And don't forget, you can have your teams do it too. We're going to talk about the team dynamic in the podcast today. So I hope you enjoy this discussion and think about how we can really focus on our strengths and not our weaknesses and change our business and change our lives. Enjoy. Every day, empowered entrepreneurs are taking ownership of their company financial health and enjoying the rewards of reduced stress and more creativity. With my background as a financial software developer, owner of multiple businesses in the interior design industry, educator and speaker, I coach women in the interior design industry to increase their profits, regain ownership of their bottom line, and to have fun again in their business. Welcome to Profit is a Choice. Hey, Darren, welcome to the podcast today. Hey, Michelle. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. I have been waiting and so excited. Both of us had changes in our calendars and schedules, and we met back in, gosh, I think it was like late September at one of the Profit First conventions in New Jersey, and um, you spoke on a topic that is near and dear to my heart, and I knew right then we chatted, and I was like, got to have him on the podcast. So I'm glad we finally worked it out. You and me both, Michelle. I'm, I'm so happy uh, that we finally have the opportunity to connect. And so, Darren, the name of your company is 34 Strong, and you take that, um, I do believe, from the Clifton Strengths Finder, where there are 34 strengths that, you know, that are out there, and we all have them in some combination. Um, so tell us a little bit about your company and what you do. Yeah, so at 34 Strong, you're absolutely right on the name. There's these 34 buckets of talent that exist out there. And the whole thing is they're all really unique to us, the ranked order. We all have these talents, these 34 different themes that are in a ranked order from 1 through 34 for all of us. But the whole point of our company being called 34 Strong is all talents, all strengths are created equal. There's not the good talents to have, the bad talents to have. It's a matter of really owning who we truly are 
and, and capturing where our zone of genius can be and collectively where our team zone of genius can be to, to get to the outcomes that we want. So in our work, who we are, you know, at 34 Strong, we believe what we, what we do is, is that uh, all of our clients have the opportunity to be great places to work. So what it is that we truly believe is we believe every employee deserves a great place to work and that any workplace can be great. Now, we're very specific on saying any workplace and not every workplace can be great because any really gets into the place of you can get there if you want to, but it does take some work. So we really help get into the focus of what does a strengths-based focus for an organization look like on the human development side. Because for any team, no matter how big or how small, if you're an army of one and you're working with partners and vendors, you still have to understand what you do best because that's always going to be the greatest value that you can uniquely bring to getting to an outcome in any situation. And in understanding that, we can get the balance of, of who we are and, and who we're not. Okay, you said so many good things. We could just sit here for a while. But one of the things that really stood out to me, and I think this, I'm so glad you brought it up at the very beginning, Darren, was all of these are equal as far as being strengths. So there's not one that's better than the other. They're just, they're all good, and they all have probably some bad sides to them, just like you think, oh, yeah. right? But mm -hmm. they're equally so. So it's not like someone is less than because they have one set of strengths and somebody else has a different set. I remember you making a comment to me and I don't want to get it wrong, but you made a statement when you and I were chatting out in the hallway after you had come off stage, that it was almost like a fingerprint, that it was so unique. The way that we have them in, you know, the one through 34. And then you couple that with the way that we've interpreted them or that we have strengthened them through our environment and situations that have happened to us. So, for example, maximizer for me might not show up the same way as maximizer for someone else. Did I remember that correctly? You sure did. Your, your results are almost as unique to you as your fingerprints. So, so to give Give just a little context to this for, for any of your listeners that aren't as familiar with the Strengths Finder, which I know you're, you're a big proponent of it. Really at the core of it, you know, there's so many outstanding personality profile assessments that are out there. The Clifton Strengths approach is lumped in as a personality profile tool, but that's not what it is at all. It's actually a talent measurement tool. So these 34 themes, these 34 talent buckets, if you will, like your maximizer, that's, that's just one of those 34. And Dr. Clifton, what happened in his career, he asked the question of what'll happen when we focus on what's right with people instead of fixating on what's wrong with them. And that became his life work, Michelle. He, he started at, in asking that question. He studied millions of people for nearly a decade to identify these 34 themes. And what he was measuring was simply talent. Now we think of talent, right? You're, you're in the interior design world, right? We, we will look at that as a pattern that comes out or the way that something looks. That is definitely an example of talent. But when he was looking at talent and evaluating that, it's really defined as what are our natural patterns of thought, feeling, and behavior that can be productively applied. So what's fascinating is with these results being almost as unique to you as your fingerprint, your, you and I, for instance, in your top five of leave, achievers, you're number three. Achiever is my number one strength. And what's really interesting is if we looked at your description of achiever and my description of achiever, they would actually be different. We would both be people that like to get things done and get things completed, which we were kind of geeking out about uh, pri prior to the show starting. But the whole point here is your achiever will be different than mine because you're surrounding your other talents surrounding your achiever versus my other talents surrounding my achiever are a little different. Mm -hmm. So think, think of this analogy, right? Are, are you a coffee drinker, Michelle? Yes. Yeah, so you, you drink coffee, right? So many, many listeners might, might drink coffee. Now, if you had two cups of coffee that were brewed identically, but one was brewed with beans from, you know, Kona uh, on, 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 on the big island of Hawaii, and the other was brewed with beans from Colombia. Now, they're brewed identically. Would they taste the same? No. They wouldn't smell the same either. But at the end of the day, they're both coffee. But when we drink them 
it, it, it would caffeinate us, it would give us energy. So there's certain elements that are very similar that these cups of coffee would bring forth for us. They would caffeinate us, give us energy, some of these different elements. But at the core, they're different in their flavor, their aroma, their appearance. And a big portion of that was developed by their environment. So your talents are a matter of your own nature and your nurture and some of your other, ta your other strengths that surround that. But coming back to it in a nutshell, the strengths finder just simply measures the presence of talent. It does not actually tell you if you're using them effectively. So if they are strengths or not, because to your point, I think you alluded to this just now, they can be our greatest assets and our greatest liabilities. We can, we can mis aim them, you know, and get ourselves in trouble. Oh, so much goodness. I'm, I'm already like my head is spinning in 5,000 directions. So I found strengths finder probably almost six years ago. And I remember I've done plenty of the disc and Myers Briggs. You know, I've I've done them all. I've been in corporate. Sure. I've done them by myself. I've done them. But I also know that most of us as individuals, while we might know what we do well or what other people tell us do well, we do tend to fixate on where we think we lack or where we think we don't measure up. Especially when you go through any type of interview process, you know, when you have to really start thinking about all that, or even when you're running a business. I know as I run my business, I know very well what feels like a struggle to me and what, what doesn't feel like it comes as naturally to me as another task. Mm -hmm. and so when mm -hmm. I found Strengths Finder, I loved, and, and you brought it up, it focuses on what's right and not what's wrong. And I'm going to tell you, you, I know if I've had just a very small interaction with this as compared to what you have, because this is what you do all day, every day. And I use this. I have every one of my one-to-one -one individual clients go through this. And in my um, build a better business series and my coaching, I have them go through it. And I have been amazed at the people who have come back to me literally in tears. I'm not even kidding. And they go, Oh my goodness. The things that I have always beat myself up at or, or thought of that I was less than is a strength. Michelle, it's a strength. And I just thought I was different than everybody else and that they were right and I was wrong. And now I'm seeing I'm not wrong. I'm different. And so the strength then, you know, it, it takes on this entirely new meaning. What they looked at as a deficit now has been something that that provides confidence and courage for them to move forward. And it's their own unique way of doing things. That has been, I think, more than anything, you know, usually with DISC, or you're always coming back seeing where you think you've screwed up or where you clearly need therapy of some time. Mm -hmm. That's just not the way it feels after Shrinks Finder. You read it and you look at it, and then you start to see, with my clients, I have them then start taking their values and tying in their value statements with their strengths finder. And they can actually see how their strengths are working out in their day-to-day -day life based on their belief systems. And like you said, kind of that strength in, in play in, mm -hmm. in their world. That's what made it such an aha moment for me was, oh my gosh, I'm not a hot mess, right? I, this right. is actually something that's good and not bad. And I mean, we're talking people that are in their 60s that have thought that they had a deficit all those years because it was their natural way of doing something. And they thought they had to change it to do it somebody else's way. And it was, it's just been relieving. I've just seen so much pressure relieved when they right. do the strengths finder. Have you seen anything similar to that? It, 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 it knocked me. I wasn't expecting that when I started yeah. having to use it. Oh yeah, it's 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 like that because you know what ends up happening, Michelle, is a lot of things. To your point, uh, I, I think you just captured this just remarkably well. People's natural way that they've done things that they may have thought that it was a deficit, or on the flip side of it, they think that uh, anybody can do this, right? Anybody can can go through yes. and really spend a bunch of time thinking about a lot of these different ideas and, and they're going to need that blue sky time to, to really think through this or anybody can quickly put ideas into words. And at the end of the day, that is through the lens that we see the world. It's through the filter of our talents. So to the, the, the piece that you were getting at is, have we ever seen this? Absolutely. A lot of times what it is, is people have not even thought of these things that they do as actual talent. They've never thought about it as I do that and thinking beyond the fact that 
maybe for instance, they naturally take accountability or there's somebody that naturally when they're starting something, they want to see where the finish line is and drive themselves and others towards that finish line in creating that clarity. That might seem like, well, doesn't everybody want to do that? And at the end of the day, that is a unique gift that not just they do, but actually creates contributions for those that they serve. And the strengths-based approach, when, it, when we go from this intimate self-awareness that takes place, and, and that, that's really the most fun, fundamental quality of all great leaders. It's not that they're all visionary or they're all good at connecting with people or influencing or getting things done. It's the fact that they're self-aware, Michelle. They know exactly who they are and who they're not. Mm -hmm. And they live into a space where they get into this African proverb. This is at the core of what we do at 34 Strong and of the core, at the core of, so, uh, of what so many of our clients aim for and become. And that a African proverb that really sums this up is, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you'd like to go far, go with others. And what that really leans into when we think of that, that proverb is the fact that we have to be confident in where we shine and confident in where we're blind. So those blind spots that we might have can be illuminated, can be filled in by others because we have been conditioned from childhood in many situations to focus on our negatives, our weaknesses, our deficits, and we're trained to think that our greatest opportunity for growth and development lies in our area of weakness. We see our report card. Think back to childhood for a moment. And, and, yes. And, and, and think about, you get an A, right? You have, an, you have a series of A's. And you look at some of those A's that you had, Michelle, and you think, I, you know, that A is great. And I really enjoyed doing that subject. Now you think of the areas where you might have had a B or a C, and we get to the place of like, oh, that C, no matter how hard I tried, it was daunting. For me, that was always handwriting. If I had to do a first grade handwriting class right now, I'd still get a C in it. It's terrible. It's been terrible for decades of practicing it. But the whole point here is what we miss when we look at a system like grading, right? The point that's missed is the fact that that A or that A plus that that student has that's, that's not the peak of their potential. That's a lot of times just the starting point. You're just showing at that point that this person's an A plus and we never really ask the question of, well, what happens if we invest in that A plus? Where does that lead to? That's the difference between excellence and mediocrity and where we focus in our lives and where we focus as business owners, where we focus in becoming profitable. Because, you know, there's this great show called Profit is a Choice but you have to do some work in getting there and know who you are and who you're not in, uh, in, in, in traveling that journey. You know, it's so interesting. I can remember being in corporate and getting reviews, right? At the sure. pull you in, do your review. And I have, I've always been, I, I am, I'm a student. I like to learn and I like to excel. I like to do great, but it never was because I felt, I'm just going to be honest. So it, here's what it always felt like to me. I'm getting straight A's and I'm not even barely putting forth full effort. Right. And that, I mean, that's the, the thought in my brain, right? I'm not going to, mm -hmm. I'm certainly not going to verbalize it in school, but I can remember thinking, wow, so that's not so hard. So, you know, gosh, if anybody ever saw that I was only putting forth half effort and I've got straight A's and then you feel like you're bragging. So you don't say anything. You just keep your mouth shut, but you keep thinking, what if I, if somebody really pushed me, what if that would look like? So that was kind of the way it was in school for me. Then I go off to college, same experience. And then I go to work and they keep saying, you're the cream of the crop. You're the cream of the crop. And I keep thinking, but I haven't even given you a hundred percent yet. I haven't even mm -hmm. given you a hundred percent. Why? If I'm cream of the crop, I'm thinking I'm average in my brain. I am just doing average for you. Like there's so much more I could do if I had a resource or B resource. You know what I mean? It's just I the do. thought process. And I'm keep thinking, I don't, I don't get it. I, I'm not anything special. So why or why have I been told that my whole life? But I'm gonna tell you, when I did Strengths Finder and I saw maximizer, strategic and achiever at the top, it made mm -hmm. sense to me. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't that I wasn't doing great all those years. It was just that in my brain, it could be more, it could be better. And so yep. even in, um, 
Well, I want to talk about in a minute. I know you have a partner and, and working with them staff and all that. I have a business coach. And one of the things that she has said to me, and I've shared on the podcast before, because I'm such a maximizer, she has to tell me to lower the bar, lower the right. bar, lower right. the bar, or I'll never achieve because I'm constantly maximizing. Mm-hmm. And, and I could not understand that because in my mind, I was never giving like I could never say that I gave a hundred percent because my mind kept making it bigger. Every time I would achieve it, my mind made it bigger, which is actually kind of a burden to bear sometimes. It is. Yeah. And so she finally gave me the freedom to realize as a maximizer that I could lower the bar from my mind, not from like what my customers wanted or needed. I was already achieving what that, what that was. I had to lower it from my mind so that I could let it go and move to the next thing. Does that make mm-hmm. sense? It, it very much, it very, very much makes sense. And, and, and I think a key piece you hit on there that you're working with, with your coach and in understanding your own talents, and, and, and this is very important for everybody, is understanding that our talents can be a complete asset to us and that can be a liability. We have to make sure that we're aiming them properly. I'll give you a really simple, tangible story that actually takes us back to the keynote that I delivered at ProfitCon. And what it was, was my daughter at the, uh, she's six now, right? She, this was about two years ago, it was in 2017, two days before Christmas, she, we were over at a friend's house and she decided, you know what, I'm going to go ahead and cut my hair. Um, That, she had nice long hair, she was a barber, she cut her hair, that did not go over well with my wife, but there was nothing that we could do, so she went from having this beautiful long hair that was down to the middle of her back to right up just below her ears that we had had to trim off. Now, she was showing these barbering tendencies in her desires and her talents, and one day, several months later, Michelle, she had actually gone through and taken scissors to the back of her brother's head, uh, <laughs> used him as, a, as another, uh, another person that she could practice her barbering skills on. Now, we, we want to support my daughter in her talents, but both of those examples are not a great aiming of those talents. She's, she's kind of lost the barber bug. I mean, she, she's six now, <laughs> but, uh, the, 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 or, the, or the hairstylist bug. But the whole point here, many times in our life, we are doing things, we are getting frustrated, and some of these tr- triggers are right through ourselves. And using your example of setting, having, having a coach tell you, set a lower bar, it's not to say turn off who you are, it's actually asking you to re-aim that maximizer in terms of focusing on what that next and new level of excellence could be. What are the other areas in your life that you can retarget that, that could create much more value? It doesn't have to have a blanket application to everything. And the more finite that we can get in aiming it, the greater our outcomes can be with those that we're working with, with the impact that we seek to have. And and that's part of the the place that we want to get comfortable in with using our talents. And, you know, it's interesting because as we talk about our strengths as it relates to profits, one of the questions that she's asked me that I know I've asked plenty of my clients, so you're doing all this extra, but is anybody paying for it? Is it profitable? Will you be able to make any money back on it? You know what I'm saying? Not to say not to do it because it doesn't need to be done. I'm not talking about base product or, you know, minimum viable product. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about when we go above and beyond, honestly, for almost our own gratification, for example, Mm -hmm. and not for something that, that has value in the marketplace or that people are willing to pay for. So that's where the conversation comes in. So just even using that or any other example, how is it that you think our profits can be impacted when we use our strengths or when we don't use our strengths? You know, it's, it, it, can, it can be impacted hugely, right? Because it gets us into a place of what's the work that we're doing. It forces us to really think of what is the core value of what we do? What are the things that we wake up and we just do so naturally well that we're really creating the impact and the value for our clients. But we got to pause long enough to look in the mirror, to take that perspective and that inventory of our self-awareness when we're just on our own. And particularly as a leader, it starts there. If you're leading a small team, if you're a solopreneur, you really have to look in that mirror for yourself and, and really identify what are the things 
that, that I create the greatest impact on and that are going to be built and driven directly through our natural patterns of thought, feeling, and behavior. What's been fascinating is in, in Gallup's research, what they found is you know, people are more engaged when we focus on working through our strengths because guess what, Michelle? People are valued for being valuable. They, we're not trying to force an eagle to become an excellent swimmer, right? It's, right. Not, it's not going to happen. The eagle, the eagle can catch fish just like a dolphin can catch fish, but the eagle's not going to catch fish the same way as the dolphin. And if I'm leading those teams and I'm saying, hey, eagle, why don't you learn to fish like the dolphin? And dolphin, why don't you learn to fish like the eagle? What do we do? We, we kill two perfectly good animals in the process. And that's a benefit to nobody. So when we can start aligning as to what's the outcome, what are the different ways that our talents can contribute to getting to that? And what are the different ways that others' talents can get to that? We can move away from seeing each other through the lens of, you don't think like me. I disagree with you. You're just difficult to starting to see people through the lens of their talents. The analogy that I love to give when we talk about this, the Golden Gate Bridge that's out in San Francisco, there's two towers that make it up and, it, and it's a suspension bridge. There's the two towers and then there's the bridge that goes across. The reason that that bridge stands and the reason it's so strong is not because all cables are pulling in the exact same direction. It's the fact that off of the two towers, there's cables that are pulling in completely different directions. There's a healthy amount of tension that creates the strength of the bridge and much the same way when we're thinking about whether we have a team or if we're a solopreneur, but we are creating partnerships with others. Sometimes that healthy amount of tension is all it is, is this, it's an illumination of our own blind spots of where our talents aren't showing up, but it's covering thinking, execution, relationship connections, influence in ways that maybe we haven't thought about and that can be of incredible value to getting to a much stronger outcome that we seek as a business. And that plays out in the lens of profitability. The, 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 the other piece that I wanted to share here is um, there, there's an exercise that we actually have. It's called Grind Greatness Genius. And I think we'll be able to have that in the show notes, Michelle. And what it is, is it gives people an opportunity to just Press the pause button, whether they've taken the strengths finder or not, whether they're a lead, leading a, a, a team or whether they're just, they just have just themselves. But ask yourself, the, the process of grind greatness genius is what are the things that we do in our work and in our life that are in our grind zone? What are the things that when we do them, you know, we might actually rather go outside and break our ankle than do these things. Well, if we're doing those things, are there ways that we can outsource them, sub them out? Are there things that we really need to be doing or can we stop them to your point from earlier are they actually generating profit or income for us are they creating impact that's valuable for our clients the greatness are things that we do really well and we're really good at them and we feel strong in doing them and we create impact now genius these are the things that we just do and we just light up the room in doing them and they could be things that happen so natural for us we're just on that next level. You're never going to fully alleviate the grind, but when you can actually pause long enough to take an inventory of those three areas, you can start asking yourself, are there shifts that I can make to be able to spend more time in my greatness and my genius zone? And it's giving you some inventory and thinking about that and having, if you have a team, to also think about having them do it. Because sometimes it's a matter of just little micro tweaks and realigning that can create massive impact and start moving the needle towards profitability by just shifting some of those roles. A couple of things. One, you know, I think that when we talk about value and, and our strengths, you made a comment earlier that you said it, it comes naturally, right? It's naturally applied. Yep. And so when something is so naturally applied, we don't tend to value it because we assume to your point, everybody else can do it. And so it's not until we realize that it is a, a talent or a strength that we have that is not whatever. Like for example, people ask me quite often, how in the world do you come up with all these ideas and all these ways of thinking? And I can't tell you how, how I do it. And I used to get frustrated because other people didn't do it like I did. I think that's just youth, right? right. And then as you get older, you start to go, wow, I can't do that. Look what they can do that I can't do. And do, mm -hmm. so you do start to appreciate it. But I think a lot of times I see that, especially in creative industries, 
where people have this ability to create, whether it's a thought, an idea, a design, um, a, a window treatment, a poster, whatever it is they are creating. Mm -hmm. And it comes naturally to them. And so therefore, they don't value it the same way that maybe the consumer would value it. And so when you talk about profits, we also have to look at the things that we do so easily that could be profitable for somebody else. I remember thinking, oh gosh, probably 10 years ago, I know that I want to share with people, but I can't think of anything I have to offer. And now looking back 10 years and looking at some of the things that I've been able to share and do and the impact that people have shared with me that my teaching has had on their lives, I, I look back and think, I can't believe I didn't even see I thought everybody already did. It's like when you go to somebody's house when you're growing up and you assume that they do the same things for meals that you do. You assume right. that they move within their home the same way that you move within yours. And then your world's rocked a little bit, right? When you go and you're like, what? You you eat that for breakfast? You put, you put ketchup on your eggs? I mean, you know what I mean? Yeah, right. And you're thinking like, what? And I think the same thing happens here. So that awareness is is critical. Not only because we're the ones running the company, but because there is value in what we bring to the company and there is value in what our team members, whether it's subcontractors, coaches, employees, vendors, there's value in what they bring and in the strengths and talents that they use to bring it to the, to the collective. So, so true. Michelle, are you uh, are you a proverbial list maker? Do you tend to make lists yes, and really, really, really stick with those? So I it's make lists that my joke, Darren, is that yeah. my lists have babies at night. Yeah, your, your lists have babies. And I, hey, you, you and me are kindred spirits. Absolutely, I've, I have lots of lots of lists, and when I when I wake up, there's there's even more. So yep. what's fascinating? This is something that, for instance, you and I do, and this might be through the filter of our talents. Now, there's some some of us we make these lists. And we naturally make lists. And that's how we get things done. And we're going to look at others and we're going to say, well, if you want to get something done, you just go, you make a list and then you follow the list and you get it done. And that works for us through the filter of our talents. Now, there's other talents that are out there that are not proverbial list makers. In fact, Michelle, you and I sometimes, we can be exhausting to go on vacation with, right? Because yes. we have to actually feel every day part of our energy and part of our talents. We feel like we get something done that gives us energy, right? So we go on vacation with family or with friends or whatever. They want to sit by the pool and they, they want to drink a margarita. And, and that's what they want to do for all the whole week that we're on vacation. And we might say, you know, we can do that on Thursday, but on Wednesday and fr Friday, we, we got to go do something. We got to go conquer a volcano. We got to go and take this tour of the city. We got to go see all these things, experience these things, check these things off of our list. And others might not operate in that same vein. So something as simple as having the talent of making a list and sticking with it, those are totally things that on a granular level, we would think that anybody can do that and can thrive doing that. And we couldn't be more further from the truth in that space because that is through our own lens of talent that we see the world. So the more comfortable we can get in seeing ourselves through that lens, and seeing each other through that lens, we can start really figuring out what are the unique contributions that each of us can bring, but what are also the unique needs that different team members have. You and I are going to need lists. In fact, I don't know if you do this, I do this. Uh, if I did something and it wasn't on my list, Michelle, I will put it on the list and I will cross it out. And people oh, think- absolutely. I, and, and there are people absolutely. looking at us, I talk about this in keynotes, and people, it always gets a laugh in a large room it, be, be, because there's so many hands that go up. And then we get into the why do we do that? It, because there's plenty of the audience that aren't these proverbial list makers. And they look at us like, you folks are crazy. Why do you have to do that? It, it makes actually, me feel accomplished. There you go. It makes you feel accomplished. It actually gives you it a sense of completion. It hits my achiever. It hits your achiever. You're, you're feeling that sense of completion. You're, it, it's also how you keep track of what you did do. And that little, little process of checking things off give you a surge of motivation and movement forward, but that's not gonna be the same for every single person. It's so funny, so we went on a family vacation. Oh gosh, and when I say family, I mean with extended family, like sisters and cousins and my parents. And 
I woke up in the morning and I wanted to know what is our plan for the day because we had a lot of people, right? So it wasn't like just me and my husband and two kids and we can plan it. We had a lot of people. Do we need to, are we doing something together? Are we going to come back together? What are we going to do? And I wanted to get up. I wanted to go outside and get my chair by the pool. And then I wanted to get my breakfast and do what I was going to do or get eat quickly and go out there. And everybody was sauntering around. By the time we got out there to the pool, of course, no chair, there was nowhere to sit. I am fuming, hot, frustrated, angry because I was up at 630 ready to go out and get on that, get my chair and sit on the beach. I would have sat out there at 630 if I needed to. And so oh. they're all laughing and they're like, we're on vacation. I'm like, I'm not feeling very vacation right now. And so the next day we split and it was like, just let me go get my place to sit. And if you guys want to wait and come out at one o'clock in the afternoon, after the whole second crowd goes in and the second crowd comes out, you go ahead. But we had to learn to maneuver that or they weren't going to be vacationing the way I was and I wasn't going to be able to vacation the way they were. And it was about strategy and, and achieving my, my seat on the beach. <laughs> you know, right. it, I mean, it literally is kind of stupid. I'm not going to lie. But yeah. it was so natural to me to get up, plan what's for breakfast. Do we have a place to sit? And every day at the beach, I like to read a novel one novel mm -hmm. a day. That is my maximizer. And that is my achiever. Do not get in the way of my one day novel reading. And so right. my family just knows mom is going to go sit there with her Kindle. And she's going to read a book a day. And if she runs out of books, we're going to Barnes and Noble. That's just what it looks like. <laughs> it's, it, you know, it's so amazing. And, and, that, and it's powerful with what you say when, when, when you take it home, when it goes to the home front, when it goes to the families and understanding to, to your point, Michelle, exactly. What are some of the things that will create frustration for us? And the real question that we have to ask when we're in these situations, if we are feeling frustrated, a lot of times it's a tell on something going up against our talents. And the right. real question is not frustration and let's camp out in the land of frustration. It's really asking the question of how do I move from frustration to fascination? Mm -hmm. And if somebody's operating from a different lens, on our team or somebody that we're working with, it's asking the question of not why, why are you pissing me off, right? Or why are right. you kicking me off? That's not gonna get you anywhere. Where are your talents coming from? If you have strengths finder results, if you have your team members strengths, being able to ask which of your talents are at play right now? What, so I can try and understand, I, I might not think exactly like your talents, but it gives me an insight into the way that you're looking at this exact same situation that I'm looking at through a completely different lens and what you're seeing as important parts. And maybe there's elements that I'm missing there. So when you right. get fascinated about talent, it actually helps to get us to better outcomes. And, and obviously the more cohesive we can be as a team and, and the more value, value for being valuable that each person can feel on a team, the more engaged they are and, more engaged uh, workplaces, more engaged teams. Well, guess what? They're more productive. They're more profitable. And, well, uh, and we can have a, have a very, very clear path on, on doing that. But starting at home is always fascinating. So I think I mentioned this to you before we came on the air as well. I also know what my very bottom strength is, and that's adaptability. Mm -hmm. And so back then when that was happening, that was years ago. I didn't, I don't, can't even remember if I'd done Strengths Finder at that point or not, but I I was not aware, right? Now I'm, a, I'm aware. So my time at the beach, my time on vacation could be very different because I am aware that adaptability is where I struggle. And adaptability from the standpoint of, I like to plan things out and follow a plan. And so right. I think I, I laughingly told you that I had mentioned on a, a podcast for someone else that one of my biggest weaknesses that I saw in myself as awareness was that um, I don't do spontaneity very well. So I have to plan to be spontaneous, Yes, but I'm aware of it. So now I can do that. And I, I sometimes now invite people into my life where that is their strength because I know that it's going to force me out of my comfort zone. And I know that if I allow myself the space to follow them, it will be a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and it's giving, and, and the thing that's beautiful in your example, Michelle, that's really important for every, everybody to hear that you captured really well, you haven't abandoned your strengths in the process. You have still said, I have a plan. Your plan is to go without a plan. 
Right. You've accepted that, but you didn't let go of the fact that I'm a person that typically likes to have a plan for the day, but you're giving yourself permission that your plan for the day is just to go with the flow as your friend, your family member sees fit, and you're going to yes. walk through that. And that's, that's the plan for the day, and you can accept that. And that creates a really powerful space, not only on our teams with those that we're working with to start embracing that and seeing how their talents show up and where it gets them and how they can, they can climb the mountain from the other side and we both end up at the top, right? right. But, but in understanding that, how powerful is that when you take it to the next generation, when you're able to start seeing your kids through their God-given talents, through the talents that were, were, were given to them and being able to say, how is it that you're showing up? Instead of saying, I want the best for you, but my concept of the best for you and your concept of who your best self is as a child are completely different. Right. You know, what's been interesting too, is I think when we, and, and, especially in a team environment, whether it's a family team, friendship team, work team, when we have a certain strength that we play to and we use over and over and over and over, mm -hmm. when we make a conscious choice to not put that into play in the same way that we have, it can throw people for a loop. Totally. Let me give you an example. Because I am a planner and an achiever and my family knows me as such, my friends know me as such, Mm -hmm. When we get into an environment where I, they usually have defaulted and let me plan. Okay. Not that I have to, but they've defaulted because maybe it's not their strength or they don't want to. And I, I, I'm always the one that waits and waits and I'm like, fine, I'll do it. Fine. I'll do it. All right. Mm -hmm. and then we get to the point where I'm like, I'm not going to do it. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then we're all sitting around looking at each other. Like, what, what do you mean? You're not going to make a plan. What's wrong with you? Why aren't you making a plan? And I'm like, because I plan to not make a plan today. And so, yep. you know, sometimes, especially when we're in community and we have a, a certain strength that the community kind of depends upon, it right. really shows up when we, we don't use it. It does. And that's part because it's, that example is great because it's a contribution that people expect you to make. And they expect that of you because they've seen it as a level of value. And that's part of the whole process of being effective with the use of our talents is we have to calibrate them. It's kind of like driving a vehicle, Michelle. You buy a brand new vehicle off the lot. You can't drive it around for the next three years and say, all I'm going to do is put gas in it. You're going to have to change the oil. That vehicle is going to hit, hit bumps along the journey. And we have to get the car, car realigned, right? We've all driven a vehicle that's out of alignment, right? Your wheels right. turned to the left to be able to keep the vehicle straight because it's out of alignment. The car can still drive in the process, but it's not driving as effectively and it's not uh, operating at, at its true potential. Much the same as our strengths. We're going to hit bumps. We're going to hit situations and we have to realign them and calibrate. And that's part of the learning that happens as you deepen your understanding of your own talents and deepen under, uh, your understanding of, again, who you are and who you're not. Part of being successful in a strengths-based approach to your own development within your own teams, within your own organizations, or just on your own, is being confidently vulnerable. Again, confident in where you shine and confident in where you're blind and owning that and accepting that and giving others a, a room in the sandbox for others' talents to really be able to show up and play. You challenged me to look at my bottom five when we were at ProfitCon because I think I'd only right. done the top five at the time. Yes. And, and I was very aware. I used my top five to help craft my marketing message because I knew what set me apart. The minute I saw it and I really thought back through my life, that's when all of these things started like slotting into place. Like, Oh, that's why I do that. That's why I thought that, you know, it, it, it just sure. makes too much sense. And you said to me, especially as the owner of the company, and I know I've said it on this podcast since we got back, um, open up the whole 34 because you're, as you shared, the bottom five are your blind spot. And it's so interesting in that awareness. I knew, like I could have told you my bottom five were my bottom five. I knew, I knew it. It was so funny because I shared it with my family and they're all like, yeah, of course that's your bottom five. Like, of course we knew that. Mm -hmm. um, it, <laughs> yeah, that, I don't, I'm not going to say that gave me the warm fuzzies, but okay. At least they know me. They love me anyway. Um, but we all have them. We all have something in that bottom five. Yep. So I, here's my question. Are there any 
particular strengths that you see for entrepreneurs that show up in the top five or 10 that you, you know, this is like the top couple that it doesn't mean it's got to be what everybody has or doesn't have, but are there a few that you kind of see repeatedly or that maybe percentage wise show up in the top five or 10 for entrepreneurs more than others? You know, I don't personally have that data. I don't know that off the top of my head. I can tell you that there's certain strengths that are very, very common in, in, in the data sets that tend to show up a lot more frequently. So those, and what, is, what is that? Yeah. So those strengths are achiever. Achiever is definitely one of those themes. Relator, uh, responsibility, um, uh, uh, learner as well. Those, those are, those are some of the very, very dominant themes that tend to show up pretty regularly within, within that spectrum, with, within the top 10. Now, what's really interesting is some of the bottom strengths, the ones that don't show up highly at all. So this, this was on a sample set of about 10 million people, and this was in the United States. So if we were to rank one through 34 in the United States, the ones that are most frequently, you know, in 30 through 34 for, uh, for, for people in the U.S., there's a theme called focus, discipline, self-assurance, significance, command. Self-assurance is actually number 34, but th those, those, are, those are the five. So the, these are talents. Wow. The reason it's so important for us to understand these ones that are also rare that don't show up as frequently. And I believe your number four is self-assurance, Michelle. It right? is. is that it correct? Is. And, and it's my number Which seven. Which is why it kind of shocked you when I told you that. Because yeah. Because you said, wow, I don't know that I've ever met a lot of people with self-assurance in the top 10 and yeah. not a lot in the top five. Right. It's, it's so true. So what's really interesting about my profile is in my top 10, I have four of the most common themes so achiever, learner, responsibility, and relator are in my top five. Once you actually look at my six through 10, I have four of those five infrequent themes. I've got discipline, focus, self-assurance, and significance. And then when you actually get to number 12, I have command. So I've got, got these on complete opposite ends of, of the spectrum in terms of how frequently they recur. Now, the reason this matters so importantly for, for, for listeners to think about is if you have one of these talents, like for you, like self-assurance, that's in your dominant talent set, there's certain things that we're naturally going to do. Self-assurance is pretty comfortable being resilient and going down the path and taking bumps along the way and then just saying, oh, that didn't work out. Well, get on up, follow me, and we can keep going. And that, and, and, and that ability to be able to push back where it's not seeing clarity and, and, and in its ability to really take that psychological ownership strongly. Those are talents that we might have naturally. And if you have that, others in the general population, others that you work with, others you connect with, well, guess what? They haven't had as much practice in working with those talents. So because they don't recur as frequently in the general population. So it's important to have that awareness because even though it's very natural for us to show up doing these things, discipline's another talent where it, it's so infrequent. When somebody has it, they naturally take a big project and chaos and all of these huge macro things and they break them down into these micro chunks and they will do that and create all of these little subtasks, sub projects to create order. That's their method to the madness. And they will naturally do that, but others don't naturally do that. So when we start basically being ourselves, doing what we do naturally, others haven't had as much experience with that. And it's helpful for us to understand where that comes from, why, and in the context of the uniqueness of it, how it can contribute, but also how sometimes we might have to adapt our communication and saying, hey, this is where this is coming from. It's coming through this talent lens. This is how it's showing up. And here's the impact that it's seeking. Which is really great if we understand it and know it. I know I'm sitting here looking at my list of 34 as you're talking. Yeah. And I've got significance at 11, focus at 12. I mean, yep. you know, I've got them right there. But, but let me ask you this. Okay, so, I mean, I, I just cannot encourage everybody listening enough to go do Strengths Finder. And if you're the owner of the company, do all 34. It, it is worth the investment to figure it out and to understand it. And then I usually have... Let's talk about teams for a minute. I usually have my clients that have teams. I have them at least have their staff do top five. And then we plot them to see mm -hmm. what they're missing, you know, as far as the whole 34 represented in the company. Sure. 
if we also look at it and I make them consider, I don't make them, but I, <laughs> I suggest that they stand there and just make them do it. Um, I suggested them to, to really look at like the next job opening, right? What they have, what are the strengths that that job needs? And then let's look, because if we hire somebody to be, um, the face of your business that speaks to everybody and greets everybody and communication is their number 34 and woo is their number 33. And you know what I mean? We're, yeah. We might have a problem here. This might not be the best match. And, and, and so we really need to think about what are the strengths that might be necessary. If I'm trying to hire a social media company, I want to know that they can communicate. I want to know that they can connect. I want to know mm -hmm. that they can do some of these things, you know, and so yep. talk to me a little bit and our listeners about how, how is a good way to start thinking about strengths in a team environment? You know, so th this is a great question. So when, when you're thinking about it from a team environment, well, first and foremost, one of the things that I would, I would highly suggest is if, if you haven't gotten a copy of First Break All the Rules, pick up a copy of First Break All the Rules. It really gets into the nuances of the strengths-based approach. If you want just the bite-sized versions of how does this play out in interviews? How does it play out in managing talent? Go to chapter seven of First Break All the Rules. That's where it gets to be super tactical. And the way that it plays out in understanding teams is, as you do, Michelle, creating team talent maps. So we're able to see how this team maps out across all 34 themes, across, uh, across these different, different areas, and start seeing how does the talent show up and you're going to have, you know, a top five for the, th for the team. You're going to have talents that are more dominant. And you're going to have some that are less dominant. The real conversation that we got to get into when we're thinking about team dynamics here is not only what are the things that this team is naturally going to do well. So if it's a team of achievers, so we've got you and I on a team, we're naturally going to want to get things done. We're going to be doers. We're going to want to get things crossed off. Think of where the finish line is. How do we get there? How do we get that completed? But we also have to ask, maybe somebody else has one of those talents that can really hit the brake pedal for us and say, hey, have we considered these risks? Why are we going to that finish line? Is that the right finish line? Or do we need to put a little bit more thought into that? It's important for us to understand that if we're a team full of achievers and we've got somebody that's maybe taking a more deliberate process, asking about where the risks are, hitting the brake pedal sometimes, it's important for us to understand that we don't want to drown that out. They can be the healthy dose of balance that can help catch us from not just getting things done, but getting the right things done, getting the things of most value completed, getting us to pause when we're wanting to move and helping us to avoid the group think. Now, this doesn't happen overnight, Michelle. This is part of the intentionality that we have to design into our culture. When we think of our, our workplace cultures, whether you're, you're a team of two or a team of 100, you can choose to be intentional and purposeful in design of your culture, or you can let it happen accidentally. And accidentally will typically cost you in the way of turnover, in the way of profitability, in the way of how you're serving your clients. So the strengths-based approach, when we're looking at it from a team side, it's two-tier. It tells us where we'll shine as a team, but it can also illuminate some of the watchouts, some of the ways that we can get our, ourselves into trouble from a group think, and being able to pause long enough to ask the question, what are the voices right now in this conversation that are not dominant? Who should we be hearing from on this team that maybe hasn't contributed? Do they have something to bring up that's going to break our echo chamber? So if we're starting a brand new company and we can start to define the culture, I can absolutely see where starting with a strengths-based approach could be um, just a really dynamic you know, opportunity. Do you have any examples of, let's say that you're coming into a company that's been around for a while and maybe they're in this process of recognizing that they either need to shift, right? They might need to, to, to move in, in their industry or maybe they've had a few bad hires. And so now everybody's getting a little bit nervous about how the team is feeling together. Do you have any examples of how we can use this, let's say, for a more mature team or one that is in the middle of a transition 
yep. versus, you know, brand new where you can start. For, I mean, there's, it's great to start with fresh talent and fresh Absolutely. everything. Absolutely. But that's yep. not where we all find ourselves after a while. And, and we could have started off great and then just through natural attrition, things happen. And you the entire it. dynamic can change with one person coming onto a team or stepping off of a team. So true. So, yes, I, I've got a great story because most of the work that we do is not in startups right out of the gate. It's in let's pause, let's do a tourniquet, <laughs> let's do an inventory, and then let's move to actually getting intentional and purposeful about the culture we want to build. But we have to pause long enough. There's a gentleman here in the Sacramento region of California, which is where I live. And years ago, we had the privilege of working with him well before he had hit the million dollar mark in his company. Now, Kyle is the founder of a company here called Twin Termite, and they have they did termite inspections. They actually have now today built out a home inspection portion of their business. They've actually gotten into doing some, some construction in, in, in different pieces as well. But at the time, Twin Termite was, was floundering to, to really grow the termite inspection portion of their business and termite treatment portion of their business. So he, he, he had had a team already in place. So like any good leader would do, based on our assumption of deficit thinking and wanting to surround ourselves with people who think like we do, what did he do? He went out and hired somebody just like him to be kind of his right hand. Now, this person that was just like him, Kyle is a dominant high thinker. He's an incredible visionary thinker. He's able to really get out there, get in front of his clients, get in front of people, influence them, but help understand what it is they do, but also help move towards a decision uh, on, on, on you know, closing new business, different things like that. He's phenomenal. And this new person that he hired had some of those same talents. So they would have these phenomenal energized meetings, right? They would have all these visions and all these ideas they would come up with and we're going to do this and we can do that. And wow, we can, we can get this completed and this is where this can lead. And they would love it. They'd walk out of the meetings, Michelle. And what ended up happening? I was, think I see the question where was, going. <laughs> who's executing on this and nobody would yep. execute and they would continue this cycle of having these and the frustration grew. Frustration grew. Strengths was introduced in and then it was realized, oh my gosh, I just hired myself mm -hmm. to do the things that I don't do well and this is not going, going to work out. Thankfully, he was in a position where he was able to transition that person into a role where they could still use those talents very effectively in their role in the way that they were serving, but he realized exactly what he did need to hire. That Golden Gate Bridge analogy, the strength being in the healthy push and pull that's running again, you know, in the opposite pull on, on the tension that creates the strength of the team. That's what Kyle was able to lean into as a leader. And it started, make no mistake about it, he ended up rolling it out way throughout his company and they've gone from just a single office in the Sacramento area to where they're doing work all up and down the state of California. It's been remarkable to grow. They've grown well past the $5 million mark over the years and, and they've done phenomenally well. But it started with his leadership team and starting to take ownership of who they were and who they weren't. So it was that self-awareness that transitioned into team awareness, more on the leadership side, and then it rolled out to the team. And it's really permeated their culture. It's been a catalyst for their growth. And they were, again, floundering at the time to get past a million and actually trying to open up other offices and be profitable. They've been successful in doing both of those, opening the offices, being profitable in the process. And that's so critical in, in the intentionality of design of the outcome and, and the people, the lifeblood of your organization and the culture you create that allows you to get there. I was working with one of my clients this week who went through the interview process, found a great hire and, and, you know, made the hire. And then she called me and she, I think I mentioned this to you in the pre-show and she said, um, this, my new employee is kind of driving me crazy. <laughs> and I'm like, what do you mean she's driving you crazy? Well, she does this and she does this and she does this. And I'd listened. And so we started, you know, at the time we didn't have the strengths finder. She didn't have the results of the employee yet. 
And so we were strategizing on our call of here's how she could handle it. Here's how you can address this at the beginning. She's, she's just starting, you know, part of this is the onboard, blah, blah, blah. This is the expectations in the office. So we're going through some very, you know, soft skills, hard skills. Next thing you know, and I have my clients, it's so funny. I have her strengths finder and hers are almost just like mine. And mm -hmm. so we're looking at it and I'm like, we are so close in our strengths. So every time she was telling me the things that were irritating her, I'm like, I understand that would irritate me too. I understand that would irritate me too. And then she sends, and we have almost the same bottom, which is interesting. Mm -hmm. My client, right? So we have almost the same top and the same bottom. So she sends me the strengths finder of this new employee. And she says, oh my goodness, Michelle, my new employee, all of her top five are all of my bottom five. Maybe I need to fire her. And I wrote back, no, don't you dare. I mm -hmm. said, that means you've hired her to fill in everything that you can't do. You don't need somebody just like you. We would fight all day over control of who got to be right or who was going to be the leader on this thing. You know what I'm saying? We, that, that's not what you need. And so mm -hmm. I wrote back and said, okay, now I can see, thank goodness it was outside looking in, right? And I wouldn't have to tell myself this for my own employee, but it's so much easier to look in than, that, than when you're in the middle of it, in all fairness. And so I wrote back and I said, you know where you said she did this? This is the, the strength that that ties to. You know where she said, you said she did this? It's, it, it comes here. You need to help her, as you would say, aim that a little bit better. You need to help her narrow in where it's appropriate and how it's appropriate to use that strength. But the fact that she's even doing these things are her strengths showing up for the job. Mm -hmm. And so then she wrote back, oh, I get it. But, but I say that because she had done the opposite of what Kyle had done and not, not meant to, but then she wasn't expecting the strengths to show up the way they did. I think she, in her mind, thought they would show up in some way and they presented differently. And so right. now it's not that the strength's not there. It's that we just have to work on the presentation within the workplace and every workplace is different. You got it. And it's, it's about aligning the big picture outcome with the fact that we're going to have different strengths and completely different approaches as to how we look at that, how people look at getting there and the contributions that they can make. But the ability to value and validate those talents and talk to each other about the lens of talent is, is pretty huge. You know, even if you're disagreeing with somebody, it's not to say that, hey, you're always going to agree and that you're, you're, talents aren't going to drive others crazy or theirs drive you crazy. But what happens when we're in the middle of a debate or we're not seeing eye to eye, you know, I'm, I'm not clicking with what you're saying, but I'm able to pause long enough and say, Hey, Michelle, you know, I'm not quite seeing where you're at right now, but can you help me understand which of your talents you're using right now to see what you see? Does that validate somebody or does that invalidate them? Oh gosh, that's a huge validation. I know it's, it's a validation yeah. of them. Even though and I'm not agreeing with you, I'm still saying, "Hey, I'm not seeing where you're seeing," but I'm validating the fact that you have talents that I don't see. So right. your approach coming back to me, what mm -hmm. starts to happen? We start breaking. Oh, some Darren, what are you using? Right? What? What, what are you you using? It gets you to pause and say, "Okay, okay. Well, you know what? Jeez, boy, that restorative is down in my bottom bottom five. Let me, let me hear where you're coming from. Let me share with you where my talents are coming from. We're not necessarily going to agree, but there's a level of respect and trust in that conversation that's built that gives people permission to be confidently vulnerable in who they are and who they're not. And again, we're, we're able to make that, that connection to get to that, that outcome that we're all seeking. That is so good. So good. You know, I've been in meetings before where I see things or will say things and, and they go, how do you see that? Well, strategic is my number two. And so it, it's almost like I am playing things out three or four different ways. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I, and, and it's not even that, like I've tried to teach people how to do it. I, it, I can't because it's mm -hmm. so natural that it's already happened in a span of seconds or minutes. Right. And that's the whole point, like with that talent, because people hear some of these themes like strategic and say, well, I don't have that high. In fact, this, this, you know, strengths finder thing showed it that it's down in my bottom five and I have to be strategic in my work. And the whole point is we can be strategic in the traditional sense of coming up with strategies, being a big picture thinker. 
you just nailed something that's critical about that talent. The reason why it shows up as a strengths finder talent is not because of our traditional definition of the word strategic. It's the speed at which you will see those three, four, eight, ten different options. Without trying. Others will, others will get there, but it takes a bit more time because they calculate certain details that Sometimes maybe, maybe that can be their zone of genius where they're saying, hey, right. there's some details. out. Those are four great options. Here's some things that maybe we want to consider on the detail level that can help illuminate which of these four are really valid or which of them really has the best amount of strength. You can get there fast, but they can pull into some of those, those details in certain, certain ways, and, and that can be the unique way that they can contribute. That, that's just an example there, but that's, yes. that's how these all play together. I'd love that. And I think this is really great if you have um, even teams that are not like in the same company. Let's say that you've pulled together some team that's across industry, right? Wouldn't mm -hmm. it be awesome, especially if you don't know these people really well, for somebody to be able to go, hey, here are my, cup top, my top couple of strengths. Mm -hmm. Because it would make me see people differently or, or see their ideas and already start to not form opinions of what they're saying, but understand kind of how they're thinking and know where, who is the balancer to me, right? Yep. I love knowing who the balancer is to me. Even when I started hiring, I have a few subcontractors. I went and looked after you talked to me about that. I mean, and it was a quick two minute conversation. I'm not talking like we, we carried on this long, you know, five day event about strength finder. It, it was, our conversation was pretty quick. It was right after your conference. But it yeah. hit me when you said, look at your bottom five. And I went back and started thinking this year, not that I'm trying to just focus on my weaknesses, but I focused on my strengths so much that I've known these were my blind spots and I've kind of avoided them because they're not my natural, right? It's yep. the least of my natural. But I also know because of the strategic, that if I want to get where I want to go, they have to be addressed. And so I am looking at my bottom five. That's kind of one of my things for this year. And I'm either looking at them at who can I collaborate with, who can I hire, who can help me navigate mm -hmm. these bottom five that are not natural and normal to me. And I'm not going to lie. I, I've hired a few people and they push back on some of these bottom five and I do feel the tension. So I know exactly what my client was saying and I want to come out like a bull in a china shop, except I have to catch myself and go, wait, Michelle, you've hired them. You've engaged them to help you with this. Now shut up and let them do what they're going to do and then talk to them and ask them and explain it to them. Cause usually there's more than one way to get what you want, sure. but it has been, it's been challenging. It's been stretching but it's been fantastic because I can already now see things that to me prior to you even telling me to open the bottom five, I would have seen as almost closed off mm -hmm. or that I didn't want to do them or that it did, wasn't comfortable for me. And now I see them as, as open and possibilities and I don't have to do it. I can hire it or, or whatever it might look like in a team environment. But I know that it, it's my bottom five. They're not moving to my top five. We didn't even mention that. But these right. might move around a little in the top 10, but my number 34 is not going to become my number one. Not, not at all. The way that you're approaching that is exactly what your listeners need to hear. It's when you unlock your full 34, when you see the top 10 and your bottom five, it's not about becoming your bottom five. It's about managing around our weakness. Because when we can manage around our areas of weakness, that gives us more time to stay in our zone of strengths where we can create the impact that we can uniquely create. And that's, that's really what it's about. So it's not trying to spend time developing your bottom five. That's not at all what you've indicated. You're actually looking at those and people around you that have some of those talents as being, a, being a, a path forward to help manage around those areas because they, they can cover those spots. Uh, true story, I'm married to three of my bottom, uh, bottom five. My wife, three of her <laughs> top five, not even top 10, but three of her top five are in my, my bottom five. So it's, it's, it's very, very interesting. And it's sure made our relationship make a lot more sense. And she was subliminally, subliminally conditioning me for years because many there's quite a few team members on my uh, on, on our 34 strong team that have uh, some of those same three within their top five as well. So I've, I've, I've learned how to work with those talents uh, 
quite well. Sometimes they push my buttons still, but I can understand and at least pause long enough to ask where are they coming from through the lens of their talents. So are any of your top five in her bottom five? Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I do. Okay. I do have a couple uh, that are that are down there as well. Just saying, you might irritate her too, just a little. Oh yeah, oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> no, absolutely. No, the, the irritation that wasn't uh, that wasn't she irritates me. It's uh, it's definitely mutual. No, I, I, I definitely. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I didn't say I did not communicate that right. It's, it's, no, it's you're fine. And, that, and that's fine. exactly and that's exactly why I love her dearly uh, so much because because we we connect so well and and have learned to really appreciate some of those things and. And, it, and it's, it's helped our communication as well. It's, it's even impacted the way that, that, yes. we, um, that we parent. I, I love that. So to me, the strengths finder, if we could um, just encourage everyone again, I, I think this is, this is something that's great for life skills. I mean, mm-hmm. just for awareness, right? Not just for business, but in relationships with friends, like you said, parenting with your spouse, I, yeah. I am, um, I really, my, my kids are old enough now that, you know, I think there's a, they're in their twenties and, and I think that it's pretty set that we could see what theirs would look like. I just about could tell you what I think some of theirs are. Mm-hmm. But it's, I think that if we even knew it within our family, just how, how amazing it could be, especially when we get into heated conversations. I've got one son who is like me. He wants to talk. He wants to debate. He wants to get it right. He wants to come up all the details. I have another son who his empathy is going to be high at the top, but the rest of us is going to be low at the bottom. But he mm-hmm. feels, he sees things and he feels them and he takes them on and that's towards my bottom. But I can watch this back and forth tension, this tug and this pull, even within, you know, good family dynamics, mm-hmm. you can see it. And and just being aware of it makes you know when to approach someone, how to approach them, how to change your messaging so that it can be heard properly, right? So um, it, it is a huge communication tool. Even if communication is not at the, the top of your list, you can use the awareness to help create communication. So on, on that note, because because you talked about some of the family dynamics, I'll, I'll, I'll just make this mention in June of this year, uh, my business partner, him and his wife are parents to seven children. They had them all together and they wrote a book that is coming out called play to their strengths in, um, it, in June of this year. So it's going to be hitting the bookshelves, uh, all across, uh, all, all over the place. Um, Barnes and Nobles, you'll be able to find it, Amazon, all that, but it's all about the process of exactly what you're talking about. How do we understand our children through the, the range of strengths, but even if you haven't taken the strengths finder and your kids haven't taken it, there's actually great questions that are in there. Uh, it, it's been profound and, it, and, and it's really, really impactful to, to a lot of those relationships. So it oh, totally plays, it, it's totally just with everything you just talked about, it's, it's, it's going to be a tool that's out there. I, I've obviously read the manuscript and gone through the process with, with seeing it come out, but they're, they're really excited. And I think it's, it's going to be um, amazing. I can, it, I can also make sure that you have a link to that um, in the show notes. If anybody Please do. Taking a look at that. A lot better than trying to do a disc profile on your 10 year old. So I'm going to do this every day. <laughs> oh, and, well, what's fascinating <laughs> with their story, seven kids that I think they're youngest wow. right now, you know, they have, I can't remember how many years are in between them, but I, it's over 18 or 19 years. Uh, so you've got some that are grown that have kids, uh, married off, have kids. You got some that are, that are working through, you know, being an eight year old, nine year old. And they, they, they have stuff that I've been able to work with, with my three year old and my six year old at going through their seasons all the way up to when they're, you're dealing with teenagers, so all the way when you're dealing with 20 somethings that are looking at flying the coop or, or getting married and, and there's applicable points at all of those levels. So it was, it was, it's just been profound. Oh, that's fantastic. Well, I can't wait to get that. So definitely send me that link oh, yeah. and send me the link to your first, no, not first grind greatness genius. And I'll make sure yep. we have that in the show notes. And Darren, as, as we wrap up, is, is there any words of wisdom or anything that you would like to leave um, our listeners with today to just be more profitable as they think about their strengths and the strengths of their team? You know, I I'm reminded of the word. So, I think you know this about me. I'm I'm am an electric bass player, right? So yes. I play bass. You played I, I, for us at the actually, I did. Yeah, I played it at ProfitCon. I played. Uh, I I had a solo bass piece that I I performed there and composed for the conference. But 
one of my favorite bass players, a gentleman by the name of Marcus Miller, he had played with, if you're into jazz, he played with Miles Davis. He's been around the block. He's phenomenal. But one of the things that I heard him say at a very young age when I was just getting into the bass, it was real simple. It said, in life and in music, no matter where it is, you got to find your voice. And at some point, you just got to do you because nobody can do you better than you can. So for all of your listeners, all of them that are entrepreneurs, that might be solopreneurs, there is a version of you that is truly your zone of genius, your zone of excellence, that's your unique signature and impact that you can have on this world through the filter of your talents. Who is that person and who's that person that you can't afford not to be? It's your life and the impact that you can have that, uh, that, that is captured through the filter of our talents. And the more comfortable that we can get playing in that place of our talents towards excellence, because none of your listeners are aiming for mediocrity in their businesses, right? right? And profitability is a show of how we're doing in our business, right? It actually shows if we're aiming for mediocrity or for excellence. So to be more profitable, be more of you, but also own exactly who you're not. That will fill in exactly like you're doing, Michelle. What are the partnerships that we need to create to get us to that level of success in terms of how we serve our clients, the impact that we're going to have, and how we're choosing to make our business profitable? That was beautifully said. I love that. Who can you afford not to be? Like, how can we not be who we're meant to be? That's, yeah, that one's going to have me thinking now. Well, and, and here's the deal. We all do need to find that voice in life and in business. And I think sometimes we're fearful because our voice doesn't sound like others. And that's actually what makes our voice so unique and so beautiful. And I, I just cannot tell people enough how much strengths finder. I mean, you could probably hear it in my voice and the fact that I just keep talking about it over and over. It's probably been mentioned the most of any one thing on all of my podcast outside of Profit First. Um, and that's because I have seen the impact that knowing who I am and being able to appreciate that and, and to not think that my voice was now hampered because I didn't have some other talent, right? I can use yep. one that I have yep. and, and it's okay. And it's okay. And I get to now appreciate um, the voice of others, as you said, by looking through the lens of their talent. So thank you so much for those reminders, for these actionable points, and just um, for coming on and having the conversation about StrengthsFinder. Darren, I know that people can find you at 34strong.com. And um, as I said, we'll put the other links in the show notes. And again, I just appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michelle. I, I really appreciate it so much being here. I'm a, I'm a huge fan of Profit First. It's been life-changing for our business and impactful for long-term sustenance of creating a road to, for the impact that we do. So thank you so much for the opportunity to share here with your listeners. I really appreciate it. Thanks. Seriously, we could have talked for hours uncovering all the nuances and potential of using our strengths and what it looks like in action. So use the link right now and go take that strengths finder assessment. I'd love to hear your top five. So you can go to Profit is a Choice on Facebook and write in and tell us what your top five are. As you also know from listening in, Maximizer is my number one. So it's no joke when I tell you that my goal is to help you maximize your profit. You can go to scarletthreadconsulting.com and get the free downloadable PDF entitled Correct Your Cash Flow and see where you can begin to maximize the money you're saving in your company today. Remember, profit doesn't happen by accident.